Oh, hello. I'm Jim the Filter Guy, and this is the Abbey Road Observatory. I was just finishing up a little work, but now that you're here, we might as well get into my next video. This one is titled Hubble Palette on the Cheap, where you will learn how to use a one-shot color camera and some special filters to make lovely sulfur, hydrogen, oxygen images. But before we get into that, why don't you take a sec and click that like button down below. And if you want to stay up on what the ARO is doing, hit that subscribe button. Okay, well, let's get the show on the road. Well, welcome everyone to the talk today titled Hubble Palette, or SHO, on the cheap. As titles go, this one is nothing special, but it at least is better than my original title. What to do if you want to try narrowband imaging, but have a one-shot color camera and don't want to buy a new monochrome camera with a filter wheel and all that other nonsense. Well, <clears throat> let's begin with this pretty image of the Eagle Nebula captured using the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble collects image data for each gas emission separately, sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen. This data is combined after the fact to form a synthetic image, one that does not actually exist in nature. This method of imaging has many advantages for us amateur astronomers, perhaps the biggest being the ability to block the maximum amount of light pollution. In the meantime, what if us one-shot color camera owners wanted to try creating SHO images? Is there anything we can do? The answer to that question involves one of my favorite things. I'm sure you're all thinking, well, we know Jim loves many refractors, but what do they have to do with SHO imaging? Well, in this particular case, I'm talking about my other favorite thing, multi-narrowband filters. The graphics department spent a lot of time on this slide, so I'm just going to let it soak in for a few seconds. Okay, that's probably good. Let's move on. Multi-narrowband filters are designed to have two or more narrow pass bands centered around desirable nebula emissions. They maximize nebula contrast by blocking as much light pollution as possible. Because they pass light in both the blue-green range and red range, they produce full-color images with one-shot color cameras. These filters make Electronically Assisted Astronomy, or EAA, and imaging from light-polluted backyards possible. Take, for example, the images shown here at the bottom of the screen. The leftmost image is what I could see from my urban backyard after 10 minutes of exposure, but no filter. And the rightmost image is what I could see using a multi-narrow band filter with 3 nanometer wide pass bands. Multi-narrowband filters have become quite popular in the last couple of years, and there are many brands and models available today. This graph presents all of the multi-narrowband filters available commercially, plotted according to the width of their passbands. The dot color represents the cost of each filter in US dollars. I have a long history with these filters, having tested more than half of those shown here. In my experience, the narrower the filter's pass bands are, the more it is able to increase nebula contrast and signal to noise ratio. These filters were developed primarily for use with one-shot color cameras, but they work with monochrome cameras as well. I have a couple more sample images to share with you. All 10 minute total exposures captured from my Bortle 9 Plus urban backyard.
with no process processing applied other than some light noise reduction and levels adjustment. This shot of the Eastern Vale Nebula was captured this past summer. And this one of the California Nebula was captured during one of the clear nights I had in November. And this shot of Thor's Helm Nebula was captured last February. Using a multi narrowband filter with my EAA setup, there is pretty much no limit to what I can observe from my backyard. Besides cutting through light pollution to get at wonderful views of nebulae, there is something else that we can do with multi narrowband filters. We can use them to turn our one shot color cameras into hyperspectral imaging systems. It so happens that emissions captured in the oxygen 3 band of the filter are picked up only on the camera's green and blue color channels. Similarly, the H alpha band is primarily picked up on the camera's red channel. Thus, with one image captured using a one shot color camera and a multi narrow band filter, we have collected two thirds of the data we need to make an SHO image. I can further demonstrate what I mean by deconstructing this image of the Western Vale Nebula I captured last summer. If I extract just the green color channel from the image, we can see the O3 emissions by themselves. Similarly, by extracting the red color channel, we can see just the H alpha emissions. Thus, by using a multi narrowband filter, we can cleanly separate these two emissions from each other. But what do we do about sulfur? Sulfur 2 emission is also in the red part of the spectrum, so to capture it, we need to take a second image using a different filter. Luckily for us, Filter manufacturers have already developed the custom multi narrowband filters we need to take that second image containing sulfur 2 only. This table is a summary of the multi narrowband filters that are commercially available today, along with their properties such as bandwidth and price. The IDIS NB2 and NB3 listed at the top are the first filters of this type to be sold being available since late 2020. The ASCAR and Altair offerings are all relatively recent additions to the list, being released within the past year. The newest edition is the offering from Optolong. The sharp-eyed amongst you have probably already noticed that there is a large range in price of these filter pairs a property that is directly related to the quality and capability of each brand of filter pair. Of the filter pairs in this list, I have personally had the opportunity to test these four. I will share with you my experience with these filter pairs and see how they compare. The first filters I tested were the IDIS pair, which I played around with almost five years ago. This is how the NB2 filter image looked, a stack of 15 20 second sub-exposures. When we split this image's color channels, we get this. The second image captured using the NB3 filter looked like this and when split into channels we get this. To assemble my SHO image I used these three channel images and ignored the rest. This is the end result. I found the sulfur 2 emission to be weak relative to oxygen 3 which made picking the best sub-exposure time difficult. 
The weak sulfur-2 signal also meant that a lot of stretching of that channel was necessary for it to contribute at all to the final image, which resulted in a noisier image and magenta star halos. If anyone was wondering, I believe this IDIS pair might be discontinued as the normal reseller in the U.S., Astrohutech, no longer markets IDIS products. If you come across a set of these IDIS filters used, note that because of their low off-band blocking, they tend to produce strong halos around bright stars. My second attempt at SHO imaging was made a couple of years ago using the 5 nanometer version of the Antlia brand pair. This is the image I captured using the normal ALP-T filter, a stack of five 122nd sub-exposures. And this is what we get when we split that image into its color channels. The image generated by the second filter in the ALP-T pair looked like this. When we split that image into channels, we get this. To assemble my SHO image, I used these three channel images and ignored the rest. Here is my resulting SHO image. The contrast and detail in this image is much better than that captured using the IDIS filter pair because this pair has much narrower passbands. I found that Antalia's idea of pairing sulfur-2 with hydrogen beta rather than oxygen-3 was a good choice, as it was easier to manage my sub-exposure times. Unfortunately, this filter pair is three times the cost of the IDIS pair, although the total price is still significantly cheaper than having to buy a three-filter narrow-band SHO set. My most recent attempt was made just a few months ago as part of a filter test I performed on the new Optolong L2 Dual Combo. This filter set pairs a second generation L Extreme with an entirely new filter, the L Synergy. You can find more information on my test results on my ResearchGate page, the link for which is provided in the comment section below. This is the image taken using the L Extreme filter, a stack of 10 60 second sub exposures captured from my Bortle 9 backyard. And this is what we get when we split that image into its color channels. This is the image generated using the new L Synergy filter, a similar stack of 10 60 second sub exposures. And this is what we get when we split it into color channels. To assemble my SHO image, I used these three color channels and ignored the rest. Here is my resulting SHO image. The contrast and detail is better in this image than that captured using the IDIS filter pair, but not quite as good as that captured with the Antlia filters. This would make sense based on the different bandwidths. The Optolong filter pair is a couple hundred dollars cheaper than the Antlia pair, making them perhaps more attractive to many users. For the remaining filter pair that I mentioned, the 3 nanometer Antlia ALPT, I don't have a similar breakdown. I do have, however, this image comparison between the 5 nanometer and 3 nanometer versions. These images were captured using the same camera settings, same total exposure, and the same amount of stretching afterwards. Clearly, the 3 nanometer filters, with their narrower pass bands, are able to deliver even better contrast and signal to noise ratio than the 5 nanometer filters. I encountered some limitations when using these filter pairs, 
The first related to camera resolution. Due to the Bayer matrix applied to the one-shot color camera's sensor, only one quarter of the sensor's pixels are actually collecting red and blue data, and only a half of the pixels are collecting green data. If I were using a monochrome camera with three separate SHO narrowband filters, data for each emission would be collected using all the sensor's pixels. The next issue relates to camera sensitivity. The Bayer matrix is a collection of filters which block light, thus reducing the sensitivity of the sensor and increasing the sub-exposure length and or the total number of subs required to get the same signal-to-noise ratio as if you used the monochrome version of the same sensor. The next thing I found was that setting the sub-exposure time and total number of frames was a challenge. A nebulous emission of O3, H-alpha, and S2 are not equal in strength, so I should be using a different sub-exposure time and number of subs for each emission individually to get the same SNR. Since I am capturing two emissions at the same time, however, it is often the case that one band is underexposed to prevent the other from being overexposed. My final comments on this idea of using multi-narrowband filter pairs with a one-shot color camera to produce SHO images are as follows. The experience was kind of fun. It gave me a new way to look at and better appreciate some of my favorite deep sky objects. This was, however, at the expense of more time doing post-processing. Not every emission nebula has a pretty SHO image waiting to be discovered. Sulfur-2 is not prevalent in every nebula, limiting what objects can be imaged in this way. It may not be obvious from my output images, but if you zoom in, you will see that my stars are all really messed up. Magenta rings of various sizes resulting from stretching each color channel's image data differently. A lot more care was required to get nice looking stars in SHO images, essentially by post-processing the stars separately from the nebulosity. A time investment I am not sure I am willing to pay, but maybe others are. The last thing to note is that some people will combine all of the image channels containing O3 data together in order to get an improvement in signal-to-noise ratio. I didn't bother doing this for my examples simply because it would have required more effort. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If anybody has a question, please feel free to leave a comment below. Alternatively, you can contact me using the email in my channel description. If you enjoyed this video, please take a moment to click the like button. If you want to keep up to date with what the ARO is doing, hit the subscribe button below. Bye for now.